Thank you, Kim. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, April 19th, 2022 meeting of the uh, Denver Regional Council of Governments Regional Transportation Committee. I see a good representation on my Zoom screen from the uh, uh, Transportation Commission, from the RTD Board of Directors, and from the Dr. Cog uh, Board of Directors. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I wanted to call the meeting to order. It's 8.30 and uh, proceed to item number two. Cam, could you tell me is anyone uh, signed up for public comment? Or let me ask folks on the meeting, if you are from the public and you have a comment to offer to the RTC to do so by raising your hand in the Zoom application at the bottom of your screen. Cam, can you tell us if anyone um, raises their hand or has signed up? I don't see any uh, raised hands. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll give it a second. But currently, I don't see any hands raised at this time. Thank you. And we don't have anyone on the phone who would need instructions. I, I don't see anyone on the phone. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, correct. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make note of uh, the meeting summary from March, uh, which is item three. If anyone has had the chance to read it and has found uh, any corrections, could you please offer them now? Right. Seeing none, uh, we will move on to our informational briefings. We have no action items this morning, but we do have some uh, some informational briefings. So the first one is uh, uh, Robert Spots is going to talk about the end of carbon monoxide maintenance. I thought he was talking about the end of carbon monoxide, but uh, it had that maintenance after it. So uh, Robert, go ahead. I don't think it'd be good if we got rid of carbon monoxide entirely. <laughs> that raises a whole host of issues, doesn't it? However, we are pleased to announce that we have completed our uh, maintenance period for carbon monoxide. That's after 10 years of non-attainment and a 20-year period of maintenance that will end our transportation reporting requirements um, for carbon monoxide. Uh, we have Rick Coffin here from the Air Pollution Control Division of the Department of Health, and he's going to discuss what that means for us and the next steps. So, Rick, I'll pass it off to you. Thanks, Robert. Can you all hear me well and see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Go ahead, Rick. Great. Well, uh, let's see here. I'll try to make this full screen. All right. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the in thanks for the intro, Robert, and thanks for having me today. Excited to be here. Um, yeah, this is a a good success story after decades of of, of working on on this issue uh, at the state level, at the local level. So I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm Rick Coffin. I'm a planner with the Air Pollution Control Division at CDPHE. And uh, today I'll be discussing the Denver Metro and Longmont carbon monoxide maintenance areas um, redesignation re request. And I'll give some info about a background about this, this issue. Um, the CO or carbon monoxide plans, as we call them, um, implement, implementation plans and maintenance plans, and then also the redesignation request and what that means. <clears throat> and I'll be I'll be going through uh, these slides uh, kind of quickly because I know you have um, other items on the agenda today. So feel free to, you know, ask any questions or say slow down or, or raise a hand or you can wait till the end. Um, yeah, whatever you'd like. Thank you, so Rick. I, I, usually, I typically prefer to wait until the end of a presentation so that we don't uh, get sidetracked. Uh, if that's all, if that's all right with members, we will wait till the end. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. So as a, a quick uh, refresher on carbon monoxide or CO, um, it's different than CO2, the greenhouse gas um, that is on everyone's minds today. And they're easy to kind of um, complete the two. So I just want to point out this is uh, completely different than that. It's not, not a greenhouse gas. Um, it is uh, defined as a criteria pollutant by the Environmental Protection Agency. So colorless, odorless gas um, can be harmful, especially um, when it's uh, emitted in high levels uh, indoors. You know, you've heard some unfortunate, really Tra tragic stories about people dying from carbon monoxide poison um, from uh, appliances, gas leaks um, indoors. So thankfully, high levels of CO are pr 
pretty rare out, outside, but when they do occur, um, they can be a particular concern for people with some types of heart disease, also pregnant women, um, young children. But uh, we haven't had high, high levels of CO in Colorado um, in decades, and I'll go over that in, uh, later on in the presentation. But basically, when we did have uh, high levels, and even today, like the highest, the main contributor to those levels um, are mobile sources across the U.S. and in the front range. Some info about the EPA's air quality standard, standards for CO. Basically, the gist of this is that in 1971, uh, they set the, the primary and secondary standards for for CO and over a one hour period, it's 35 parts per million. Over an eight hour, eight hour period, it's nine parts per million. And basically those levels cannot be exceeded more than once a year. If it is, then it's a, a violation of the standard. And um, that primary standard has remained um, untouched. You know, it's been retained since 1971. Basically what that means is that according to all the research um, out there, medical studies, scientific studies, um, that that level that that level as a standard is still um, adequate to protect public health and the environment. <clears throat> so in the 1970s, uh, as you can see that photo here, that's what rush hour used to look like, <laughs> um, bumper to bumper. Uh, you know, we had some air quality issues. It's not a secret. Um, the brown cloud. Uh, we had hundreds of exceedances of the CO standard each year. Um, and basically, if you look, go back and look at the monitoring data from back then, um, they mainly occurred during rush hour, like morning rush hour and uh, the evening rush hour. And uh, as a result, EPA designated the area as a non-attainment for CO in 1977 more pictures, it's kind of unbelievable um, to, to me <clears throat> how easy it was back then. And here's a map of the Denver Metro, CO area, multi-county area, and also the Longmont area. So thankfully in the 80s, um, the as a result of federal tailpipe uh, standards and fleet turnover, like basically cars were getting cleaner, exhaust systems were getting cleaner. Um, that really resulted in uh, a, a great reduction in CO emissions. And that on its own may have been enough really for uh, the area to come into compliance with the, um, the CO standard. But, the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission, they're a governor appointed group in Colorado that uh, are tasked with um, addressing air quality issues in the state. Um, we were, they were working on other issues that have co-benefits um, for reducing different types of pollutants, but um, to address CO, we were the first state in the country to require use of oxygenated gasoline, basically, um, uh, that uh, that type of gasoline burns like more efficiently or cleaner, especially during the winter, during cold cold uh, temperatures. Um, we also had wood burning stove controls that uh, helped reduce CO and also particulate matter or PM uh, levels in the area. <clears throat> and then, as a result of of those control measures. Uh, the frequency of CO exceedances decreased greatly um, throughout, actually throughout the 80s and um, by the early 90s, but we weren't able to achieve those reductions fast enough. And as a result, uh, the area was kind of bumped up, um, classified as a moderate CO uh, non-attainment area uh, in 1990. And the state was working on plans to address those emissions uh, really throughout the 80s and into the 90s. And as a result, 
of our planning efforts and the federal standards. Longmont has not experienced a violation of the standards since 1988, and uh, Denver hasn't experienced one since 1995. And that's actually the last violation of the CO standard in the entire state was in 1995. So we've had decades um, of increasingly low uh, levels of, of CO emissions in the state. So basically, when an area no longer exceeds a stand, um, or no longer violates an uh, air quality standard, uh, they can request to be designated from non-attainment to maintenance slash attainment. And to do that, the area, if one has to meet the CO standard, they have to have a, a SIP or a state implementation plan that's been approved by the EPA. And that plan has to include federally enforceable measures that are permanent um, and show that they have contributed to the reduction in emissions. And basically the area has to follow all the requirements under, under the Clean Air Act. And the, the, the state and or locality have to develop a maintenance plan. As Robert mentioned, um, after being in attainment for, for so long, the area has to go through 20 years of maintenance and uh, over that time period, there's a maintenance plan that they have to stick to. So we developed a maintenance plan. And you know, even though the last exceedance wasn't, um, you know, was in 1995, it still took a number of years to develop the plan and uh, submit it. Here in Colorado, we have to have legislative review. And that usually adds another like half year to, to a year to the process. Uh, and then once it's submitted, it usually takes EPA a couple of years or so um, to get through public comment and uh, approve the plan. And, and then once they approve it, there's an effective date. And then from this table, you can see here, uh, the, the effective date of the first plan, if you track that date um, to the date in the last column, that's 20 years. So basically that's the 20 year maintenance period that um, really the important requirement here is transportation conformity, which is um, one of the elements that Dr. Cog is so involved in. Basically when an area is non-attainment maintenance, it has motor vehicle emission budgets. Um, decades ago, they, those were called mobile source emission budgets and now they're called motor vehicle emission budgets. And basically, uh, when an MPO uh, is developing a plan, they have to show that all the projects that are put into their um, transportation improvement program and regional transportation plan uh, uh, do not exceed the motor vehicle emission budgets. So they have that requirement holds until the date in that last column for CO. Um, and basically, the plan includes emission inventories, uh, demonstration that we will um, maintain the standard. We have monitors in the area to monitor CO levels to, um, you know, just uh, to show that we're achieving the standard and the control measures that were uh, first two were covered previously. And the third bullet is uh, permitting uh, requirements for industrial sources. Here are the CO levels uh, since the since 1990 to now, as you can see, they dropped off significantly. Um, you can see there was a little bump up in 2013, 2014, and then 2018, but still very, you know, relatively insignificant. I asked our monitoring folks what what those bumps up could be attributed to, and they they said, you know, it, it was probably a combination of just meteorological conditions. Um, you know, there, nothing really, it doesn't track with wildfire smoke. Um, otherwise, we would have seen uh, higher increases in, in the last few years. Um, so, yeah, nothing of concern now. You know, we, we don't have any concern that levels will go up because vehicles are just getting cleaner and cleaner. <clears throat> so now that we've gone through 20 years of maintenance for both of these areas, 
we could request uh, redesignation to from maintenance to complete attainment. Um, until EPA completes that uh, redesignation, everything in those maintenance plans have to be complied with. The only requirement that that kind of ends after 20 years is that transportation and general conformity no longer applies. But everything else in the plan um, stands. We, we can't decommission any monitoring sites until EPA approves it. I think we'll always need to have at least one uh, CO site in the area due to um, the population level in, in Denver. Um, but we can, we can possibly, um, if EPA approves it, uh, remove some monitoring sites and maybe use them to mon monitor ozone. Um, and and basically uh, that last bullet there, the 110L demonstration may be fulfilled through a review of monitoring data. Basically, since the levels have been so low for so long, um, EPA has signaled that uh, that may be a, a enough of an analysis to fulfill that requirement. And we're hoping that our commission will adopt our request for redesignation this summer. Um, next year, we'll submit it to the legislature for their review. And then we'll submit it to EPA. And um, it'll probably, we'll probably hear back from EPA in a couple of years or so on this. So maybe by 2025, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have this behind us. Um, but overall, you know, I, I just, wanted to highlight this is a success story. You know, it shows how um, federal standards and, and state regulations and, you know, local action all combined can, you know, result in success, you know, to improve air quality. So um, we, we've done it before. Now we're working on it with ozone and greenhouse gases. So um, it might take a long time to shift, but it's possible. And, uh, you know, I, I was going through I was going through, uh, let's see, how do I stop sharing? I was going through my, the office recently and I found this old ad um, <laughs> that was placed in the local papers. It says goodbye carbon monoxide and there's a clever little, uh, uh, so long invisible poison, farewell odorless tasteless killer. <laughs> there's a, a clever little ad down there. Um, so yeah, overall success story, and maybe someday we'll we'll be able to have an ozone goodbye ozone or goodbye CO2 ad um, in the paper. But uh, yeah, thanks again for having me, and thanks again for all the work you do. Um, any any questions or anything? Yeah, thank you, Rick. Uh, a very poetic ad there uh, when you read that. Only some <laughs> Shakespearean. Uh, let me first ask if. Uh, uh, before I go to Mike, uh, let me first ask, uh, do any of the CDOT commissioners want to comment on this? Uh, and then we'll go to questions. If not, we'll go right to Mike. Okay. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Yes, good morning and um, get my microphone or my video here undone. Thank you very much. And Rick, great presentation and an excellent walk down memory lane for, for me. Uh, th this is what I used to do in the old days, developing these um, carbon monoxide um, attainment and maintenance plans. And it's just a real success story for the region. And, and as Rick mentioned, a lot of the, the credit goes to just fleet turnover, cleaner cars over time, but the, the oxy fuels program and that inspection maintenance program that we all love so much that we still have for ozone purposes was really the, the things that put us over the top. And so it's just a testament to all the planning work that uh, Dr. Cog has done over the years to um, address transportation issues at the Regional Air Quality Council and the Air Pollution Control Division, uh, the hard work to um, bring forward strategies and voluntary approaches and our education outreach efforts to improve air quality that we're just continuing um, because of our ozone problems and, and other air quality issues. So uh, th that's, that's just what I wanted to add to the presentation. and, and um, I think back in the 1980s, if anyone is old enough to remember when the Broncos were in the Super Bowl in those days, um, the commentator, I think it was Pat Summerall said, Denver, you know, after we were losing badly, said, well, at least Denver's uh, number one for something, it's air pollution. 
and it was because of carbon monoxide. And that was on national TV, and that got the attention of a lot of the political leaders back then to um, to take this seriously. And so, uh, um, you know, air pollution means a, a poor economy, and a, a good economy is is tied to good air quality. So. Um, thank you, Rick, and, and thank you, everyone here, for, for all the hard work you've done over the years. We've got to be known for something else. If the Broncos have been ahead that night, maybe we wouldn't have taken a lap. Uh, Executive <laughs> Director Rex, go ahead. Thank you, sir, very much. And um, Rick Coffin, thank you, sir, for being here today and, uh, and acknowledging the this important milestone for us, right? I, I just really wanted to echo what Mike Silverstein said. And listen, given the challenges that we do have on an air quality front right now and our um, you know, us trying to get to grips on how we're going to mitigate and rectify that problem. It is, and I think it's important to celebrate successes, right? And, uh, you know, listen, this is, this is the result of work that was done long before many of us were, were in the planning field. And uh, I want to thank them um, for everything that they've done to get us to this point so we can, we can see Mount Evans on a, on a, on a good day. And, and uh, I think that's really important. Um, I, uh, there was one other thing I wanted to mention. Uh, and it is totally gone, but it had to do with ozone. Not gone, but we, we got an ozone problem in case you're wondering. <laughs> I've heard. I've heard. Yeah, check your CO uh, detector there in the in your uh, apartment, uh, your house there. Right. So you can be brain. Uh, thank you. I just had one quick question if no one else wants to go uh, right now. And that is what really impressed me was the notation in our in our agenda in the packet that we are one of the first regions to reach this. And being a lay person, maybe you could help me understand this in terms that, that an ordinary reader or observer would understand. I had always uh, believed and heard on, on moving here 40, a little over 40 years ago, that our elevation uh, worked against us, that the, th the thinner air here was a component in, in in uh, the results we were getting. So what are some of the other areas, Rick, if you know, you said that we are one of the few areas to, to reach this level. What are some of the other areas and what is the difference between them and us? What, how is it different for Denver Metro? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, yeah, I saw Mike. Yeah, I could go, I could uh, respond and I think Mike, you unmuted and if you want to add anything, you can certainly add, but yes, uh, our elevation does present uh, different challenges, uh, you know, between the elevation and uh, the meteorolo meteorolo meteorology of, of the area, along with the geography and the front range, um, it could cause stagnation. Um, so we're up against a, a few different, a few different kind of a combination uh, of different things. And there's high population in the area as well, which means more industrial sources. And um, there's also oil and gas development close by, which is uh, kind of like a, you know, a perfect storm for some pollutants. But basically, you know, we're, we're um, as far as I know, we're the, the first area, um, as far as I know from EPA, we're the, the first area going through this process because really areas are just reaching 20 years of maintenance now um and i believe some other areas were designated around at about the same time that we were because epa usually does the designations and in, in batches and in groups together um but we're we're kind of uh you know um trailblazing uh new territory there, there aren't any examples of uh, you know, a, a, a de designation to complete attainment that we can kind of use as a template. <laughs> so we're working close with EPA as far as what we need to do. There, there isn't a clear guidance document on this either because, it, you know, it's a new thing. Um, but there are some areas in the country, um, I think in California, um, some other states in the, in the West that uh, are in non-attainment for CO still. Um, so, and I believe uh, that's mainly due to, to, to more mobile sources um, and perhaps those areas don't have a history of the state and local um, measures to address mobile sources as in, you know, what, what we went through in the, the 80s to really tackle the problem. 
Thank you. Uh, Mike, did you want to add mm -hmm. to that before I go to Director Cook? Well, sure, that's um, a great uh, explanation, Rick. And, and this is really an administrative process. As, as was mentioned, you need to come into attainment first and then submit this uh, redesignation request to EPA, and that takes a while. And then you need to be in, in maintenance for 20 years. So the Clean Air Act was amended in 1990 that kind of kicked off this whole process. And guess what? We're about 30 years or a little more than 30 years from that time now. So these 20 year maintenance periods are ending and they're ending for a lot of areas in Colorado that used to be non-attainment. All of our mountain towns were non-attainment for particulate matter. They'll be following this process. Colorado Springs for carbon monoxide, Fort Collins and Greeley. All of them will be on the, the heels of this, but across the country for carbon monoxide, since that problem really was uh, mostly solved in the 90s due to the, uh, the new programs and the cleaner cars. Um, you know this this will occur, but it's it's a it's a lift to get through the the federal requirements, and you have to maintain your programs. You have to be in conformity with um, the carbon dioxide um, uh, standards through the transportation programs, as as Robert um, so artfully uh, describes now and then when conformity comes before the group, and um, so it's it is a long administrative process. But again, it's that. Uh, it's, it, this is a celebratory time where we can actually say we, we got out of um, a, a federal requirement. The, the measures need to stay in place because they're important for other air pollution issues, but um, it really is a success. And the transportation planning and conformity process that Dr. Cog has gone through seemingly every year for carbon monoxide for the last 25 or so years has really been, been helpful to the process. Thank you, Mike. Um, thank you, Rick. Uh, Director Cook, go ahead. Yeah, I think Mike just answered, but just to verify, um, the the framework and the, and then the process is the same uh, across all the pollutants. So that's what we're facing for ozone, for example, just verifying that piece. Oh, yes. Um, we first have to come into attainment. And uh, that's a tall order. And so once we get to attainment with our, our control programs and, and improvements in technologies and so forth, then we could become eligible for redesignation. Let's, let's be hopeful and um, assume that occurs before 2030. And then, um, then we move into 20 more years of maintenance, so 2050. So we'll be doing this for a long time. And, and Dr. Cog, through its conformity process, has to show that the transportation uh, network does not cause or contribute to future problems. And so that's, that's a heavy lift. And it's a responsibility of Dr. Cog, along with other partners, to make that demonstration you know, year after year for, for quite some time to come. Thank you. I'll try to hang around for that 2050 date. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're hoping for that. Yeah. Your director, Rick, go ahead. Well, me too, Mr. Chairman. I, I remember what I was going to say about ozone um, with regards to, you know, it's it's been a it's been a long tour for us, right? We've been we've been doing conformity determination on ozone for a long time. And as they continue to ratchet down the, the standard and and rightfully so, um, you know, our ability to affect change is is you know comes less and less. And I think it's uh, uh, really, it's because of the strong partnerships that we do have with the department, as well as other stakeholders throughout the region, that's really allowed that to happen. I can tell you from someone who's worked in three other regions throughout the country that the, the relationships that we have are not necessarily the case in other parts of the country. And um, so I really, really do appreciate the, the, uh, the respect and coordination that we do have because, you know, our ozone problem here, up to 70% of the, of the precursors to ozone are generated by transport. So they, it comes from other places, either other states or internationally. So, um, you know, being able to affect that change in 30, 40% of the, what's generated here, it takes everybody rowing in the same direction to get there. So I really do appreciate um, the support that we have with, uh, with all of our partners. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, again, I apologize for my clock dinging. I always seem to have my mic on when my clock is going off. Uh, do any of the CDOT commissioners have any comments? I just want to thank uh, the state. Also, thank you to RTD uh, for, uh, for your role in all this. Uh, I, I, I remember those days that you, that you showed, uh, Rick, in the newspaper. Uh, Commissioner Stanton, go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Flynn. And I really appreciate what uh, was just said. I wanted to add 
another layer to all this while we're patting ourselves a little bit on the back. We have increasing demographics affecting us in Colorado, more people moving in, increased logistics traffic. And not only that, but we have a right now a red flag alert, and we're going to have that for our lifetime. So we're getting affected by burning things coming into our state from California and the region. And I think we need to put this in perspective because we're not, no man is an island. Colorado is not just a little state with a square around it. Absolutely. Thank you uh, for that, Vice Commissioner. Uh, yeah, uh, Director uh, Williams, go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, I also want to point out that we need to look long and hard. I've been following um, some of CDOT's work on the type of direction that we're headed, which is penalizing um, transportation carriers, uh, trucking agencies, whatever, for their um, part in this situation that we find ourselves in. But I want us to be aware that most of those companies are not going to eat those penalties. They are going to pass them along to the people who use their services, which in many cases are older adults, um, as many of us here are, the fastest growing population in Colorado. No, no, it's okay, Kevin, not you. Um, and, uh, and people with disabilities and low income, and we need to be careful and look hard at how we are dealing with the situation so that we don't end up costing the most vulnerable of our people. Thanks. Thank you, excellent observation. That's so true in a lot of the things we're dealing with at all levels. I appreciate that. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised, so uh, let me move on uh, to the next agenda item. Now that we've crawled out of the frying pan, Jacob Rieger is gonna put us uh, back into the fire with the 2050 RTP greenhouse gas update. Uh, Jacob, are you ready? Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Give Thank me you. just a second to share my screen. Yeah, I wish I didn't have to follow such a good news presentation, but <laughs> we should have had you here, first. <laughs> here we are. Okay, let me get this in presentation mode. Okay, hopefully folks can see that. Got it. Thank you. All right. So yes, as, as our chair eloquently said, let's jump into the greenhouse gas fire. Um, but we have been working very hard on uh, the greenhouse gas analysis, the GHG analysis for our 2050 regional transportation plan as required by the state greenhouse gas rulemaking. So wanted to give you all an update on kind of where we're at and where we think we're going. So first, just kind of start out with some key points. Uh, let me move something on my screen here. Um, so in terms of um, there, we're, we're going to talk about some aspects of the state GHG rule today and, um, and try and demystify some things. One of the first things is um, how the rule defines the baseline. That's one of the terms in the rule. Um, and, and I'm sorry, oh, there we go. Okay, I thought the animation was a little funky. So yeah, let's start with the key point. Um, our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan demonstrates greenhouse gas compliance for the Dr. Cog region. So what that means is that according to the rule, um, it's the responsibility of our 2050 RTP to show for the Dr. Cog MPO region that we um, can attain or meet um, the emission reduction targets that are in the rule. As you know, our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan includes everything that all of the agencies at this virtual table today and all of our stakeholders are doing in the region, whether that's Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD, local governments, and others. So all, that all gets ultimately collected into, integrated into our 2015 um, RTP. And again, really the point here is just, you know, sort of building on that partnership theme um, that Doug and others talked about, that it really requires close coordination because at the end of the day, the decisions that uh, multiple agencies make um, ends up uh, being sort of vested in the 2050 RTP in terms of demonstrating compliance. Um, the next point, the GHG rule baseline, this is a definition from the rule. Um, the baseline as defined in the rule is how we modeled the 2050 RTP when we adopted it um, a year ago. Um, and I'll talk more about kind of the modeling piece as we get into it. Um, but it's really as the plan was modeled a year ago at the time of adoption, that sets the baseline for the upcoming GHG analysis. Um, the emission reduction target amounts that are in the rule are from the baseline by analysis here. And I'll show you that table and explain that in just a moment. Um, so, you know, we're, 
we've been sort of working hard on establishing the baseline, uh, which again sets the parameters for the analysis that we need to do. And then from there, we start doing kind of that initial analysis to really just understand the bracket of, you know, how close are we to attaining the target, the emission reduction targets that are in the GHG rule. Um, so this is frankly where we're at right now, and this is the work that we're doing. Um, but in the preliminary analysis, as we expected, you know, we're getting we're getting part of the way there, but we still have um, that additional gap to fill uh, to meet the emission reduction targets. Um, coming back to the adoption modeling again, as the plan was modeled when we adopted a year ago, you know, first to emphasize that all of the great work that we did together over the last two years, you know, two, you know, a year ago, but over the last two years um, to prepare the 2050 RTP and all of the great projects and investments in that plan, you know, billions, tens of billions of dollars for transit, uh, for multimodal, um, safety, you know, all the things, all the good things that are in the plan, um, you know, that really helps us sort of establish our baseline. So that's really important. Um, but the adoption modeling didn't include at the time some of the programmatic or category investments. And I'll talk more about that kind of what's in and what wasn't in at the time. But the point here is that these are the things that we're starting to look to, to kind of fill that gap in terms of meeting the emission reduction targets, because those are really important components of the plan. It's, it's about $14, $15 billion um, worth of things that at the time weren't identified as projects, because remember, it's a 30-year plan. But whether they were set-asides, whether they were category investments, whether they were programmatic, um, those were all things that were really important um, as part of the plan um, that we're now sort of trying to capture, you know, what is the GHG benefit, the emission reduction benefit of those, um, of those investments in the plan. Um, so then finally, as I've said, that staff has been working to establish the baseline as defined in the rule, and then that helps us identify, uh, and then from there, uh, then we can start identifying how to quantify these programmatic GHG benefits in our modeling work. So let's talk about the rule a little bit in terms of the emission reduction targets. And um, this is a table for which we got a lot of questions at our Transportation Advisory Committee meeting. So I wanna try and demystify this and explain this as clearly as I can, um, because it's easy to look at this and say, you know, are these percentages, are these numbers, are they cumulative? How do they relate to each other? Um, so let me, try and, let me try and demystify this. This comes straight from the rule, first of all. This is the um, amount of uh, the reduction levels in million metric tons on an annual basis that are required for Dr. Cog and for the other MPOs in this state, as well as CDOT, um, to meet uh, the emission reduction targets in the rule. These emission reduction targets are by analysis year, as you see, so 2025, 2030, 2040, and 2050. So for each of those analysis years, we have to demonstrate, in our case, that the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan can meet these emission reduction targets. And the way that the rule is structured to do that is it says you compare the plan as revised, so the work that we're doing now on the plan, you compare that to the plan as adopted last year and you compare it by analysis year. So we look at 2025 um, analysis year for when we adopted the plan a year ago, we look at the emission reduction or the, the emissions uh, for 2025 analysis year. And then when we complete our work that we're doing now to sort of revise the plan um, and we run the models and we look at the emissions uh, we compare that result for 2025 against the result that we got for the year 2025 when we adopted the plan a year ago. And according to the rule, we need to reduce by 0.27 million metric tons um, between those 2025 analysis years. And that's the same for 2030, 2040, and 2050. So again, we're looking at the plan as we revise it once we run the models and, and do the analysis, the plan as revised against the plan as adopted for each of these years um, to understand the emissions and the emission reduction targets. So Mr. Chair, I'd like to violate your rule and just kind of pause there and ask if there's any questions on that particular point. Do we have any, <clears throat> do we have any questions? Uh, I just want to try to understand the chart a little better, um, Jacob, is that th this obviously isn't a cumulative table. Uh, 2025 is 0.27, then by 2030, 0.82, uh, while maintaining the 0.27? Yeah, so that's where it can get confusing. Thanks for that, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. So these these results, I mean, they ultimately relate to each other um, in terms of just how the, the work was done to establish the state GHG rule, right? But in, in brass tacks, really, these are, in a sense, separate. Um, so we're not, they're not cumulative. They don't add together. It's not that kind of relationship. The relationship is between the plan as revised and the plan as adopted for each of these analysis years. 
So, Thank you. And, and yeah. these are actual emission, um, redu emission reduction amounts for each analysis here. So hopefully that's clear. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I don't see any. Go ahead, uh, Jacob. Uh, okay. I think that was the hardest mathematical part of this. I don't think there's any, any more math in the rest of the presentation. So when we talk about, um, you know, I said it's based on the plan as modeled when we adopted it last year. Um, and so I want to talk about well, what does that mean? Um, you've seen a version of this slide before when we were preparing the plan that makes the point. There's many different ways that we express or include investments in our multimodal transportation system in the regional transportation plan. And some of them are listed here. We can do that through projects that we're all familiar with, lines and dots on a map. Um, we have project categories of things. You know, we want to fund projects relating to active transportation or safety. We can do investment allocations in our financial plan um, to meet federal fiscal constraint requirements. You know, and there's other ways that we can express investments in, um, in the plan that ultimately what it takes to uh, maintain and, and evolve our multimodal transportation system. So when we were doing the modeling for adoption last year, what we included in the model is what you see on the right, things like new roadways and uh, roadway projects, new interchanges and interchange improvements, uh, rapid transit, um, and, and the things that you see there, in particular, a really strong bus rapid transit network um, throughout the region that we want to implement by 2050. So all of those things that, you know, you've seen the plan, you're familiar with, those are the things that we included at the time. What wasn't included in the model at the time were things that were more sort of conceptual or weren't specific projects that you would show on a map. So for example, we have a lot of projects that we call corridor transit, corridor transit planning projects. And, th and those have a really kind of high dollar amount because the idea was to invest in those corridors and, and sort of further uh, defining and implementing a vision um, and investments in the corridor. Um, active transportation projects, safety projects, freight projects, things like that that weren't necessarily things that you put in a model or put on a map, uh, but those investments were included, included in, in the plan at the time, but they weren't modeled when we modeled for adoption a year ago. So now as we think about um, as we're meeting, you know, trying to meet the GHG rule and, and looking to the plan and the intent of the plan and the investments of the plan. Now we're trying to think about how can we model some of these things, you know, transparently and in good faith that we can show um, the greenhouse gas benefit from, you know, the intentions and, and the investments in the plan. So we're looking at things like corridor transit planning, um, active transportation and regional vision zero and safety investments in, in the plan. We're looking at things like um, again, this corridor transit planning and the active transportation set asides, some of the other sort of programmatic set asides um, that we had in the plan, operational safety signal and equipment improvements, all of the things, again, that you all know that it takes to maintain, improve, expand, and evolve our transportation system. So actually, let me pause here and just make the point. So this is where we're really looking to sort of fill out um, the modeling gaps, so to speak, of what was what has always been in our plan, what you can find in our tables, in our financial tables, in our fiscally constrained financial plan, all of the things that are in the plan, um, but we didn't model a year ago. Now we're trying to figure out how can we model these things because they're really important to implementing the 2050 RTP. Um, this is kind of a different way of showing this. Um, so I guess there's a little bit more math here, so apologies for that. Um, but what you're seeing on the left-hand side is some of these categorical programmatic elements that are in the plan. I'm not going to read them all here, um, but again, we've kind of covered some of these major multimodal elements. We've calculated how much is in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. As I said before, it's over $15 billion. So really important stuff, really high dollar, high value stuff that's in the plan. And we've been doing analysis to kind of figure out from a GHG perspective, how much of this is applicable and understand that everything that's here is sort of in addition to what's already been modeled. And I'll come back to that in a second, but we're trying to sort of transparently and, and frankly conservatively say, you know, what proportion or what percentage of this amount of funding for these types of projects or these types of programmatic investments, is it fair um, to sort of look at for GHG benefit? And then we calculate on the far right, based on that analysis, the associated total funds that are applicable from a GHG perspective. So let me just walk you through this a little bit. Let me pick a really easy one. We think, and, and we think this is true, that when you invest in active transportation, so when it says additional active transportation beyond what we already included in the model and adoption, we've calculated that that's almost $200 million of additional investment in the plan. Well, look, we think that anything you do in active transportation really should help from a GHG perspective. So we think it's fair to say 100% of that additional investment ought to count towards GHG emission reduction benefit analysis. 
Whereas, for example, the regional BRT, the ancillary improvements, well, we've modeled the BRT network in the plan. Uh, we show those in the in the model, I should say. Um, you know, we modeled those. We show those. We show the, that network. Um, we show that capital investment. We show the service associated with the BRT in the model. So, really, we, we've already captured that in our baseline. The increment that we're trying to capture here is some of those ancillary improvements that go with um, implementing a regional BRT system, things associated with stations first last mile kind of access to those stations, things that aren't easily captured in the model, but you know, are part of making the BRT network work. Um, and that that's fair to sort of count at least a small part of that from a GHG perspective. Um, so it's the same kind of logic for all of these in this table. But again, we're trying to, trying to suss out, you know, where are the investments in the plan and how applicable are they to a GHG analysis? And actually, I guess that was my last slide um, because that's really kind of where we're at is to understand um, you know, what, how we can then express that in the model um, and kind of where that takes us for the next steps of analysis. So I'll end here, um, but I just want to end by first um, really thanking, there's a lot of smart people at Dr. Cog and several teams working on this work. It's complex, it's kind of uncharted territory for us. So I want to acknowledge the team effort here um, and just kind of close with saying we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jacob. And certainly thank you to our, our team for going through all that. It's uh... It does look very complicated. It's going to uh, uh, challenge us in quite a bit uh, to fully analyze our, our plans. Uh, let me solicit questions from members. I don't see any hands right now. Okay. But Jake, if you, you got off easy for having put us right back into the thick. Thank, Thank you, you very Mr. Much. Chair. Let me uh, go back to my screen that has the uh, agenda on it. And I see that now that we're done with number five, we move on to administrative items. And that is uh, member comment and other matters. I uh, wanted to have a discussion on a future meeting format. And uh, Doug, do you want to uh, introduce this? Yes, sir, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so we talked a little bit last time about our desire to uh, begin to meet in person um, as a group. So we just wanted to throw it open to the group just to get a conversation going about what your desire is about um, whether this meeting time is, uh, is, a, is, is good for everybody or we can look at alternate dates, times, whatever it is. But um, the, only, the only preference, of course, we would have or the actual only requirement we would have is that this meeting occur before the Dr. Cog board meeting on the fourth Wednesday, or sorry, the third Wednesday of the month. So um, I just entertain any comments or discussion, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. And format would refer to whether to meet in person or to continue to meet virtually. Uh, yes, sir, but I will I will set, tell you that I think it, it is based on the conversation that we at least had with the executive committee. And we, we had a little bit last time there is some value, of course, with uh, with meeting in person um, and being able to establish those relationships with, uh, particularly with new new commissioners. Selfishly, from Dr. Cog's side, uh, with new commissioners as well as new RTD directors and and of course our other stakeholders. So um, we would really strongly encourage this group to to meet in person. Um, and if this date and time is fine, then so be it. But uh, we wanted to at least provide an opportunity for discussion. Thank you. Don't rush all at once here, folks. <laughs> uh, okay, let me kick it off by saying if uh, were we to meet at this time uh, in person at the Dr. Cog office, uh, we would have been uh, we would have been contributing to congestion and uh, greenhouse gas in our travels to some extent. Uh, but also for my personal schedule, it would work out that I could be at a weekly 930 meeting with the mayor, which I can't make because I'm doing this here from my home. Uh, the council meets with the mayor every Tuesday at 930. And then there is a council committee meeting at 1030. Uh, but for me, that's convenient because I would be downtown. And, and that's where my, my office is. How does that work for other folks? Is a morning meeting better to kick off your business day? Or would it be better as uh, TAC does, TAC meets, I believe, on Monday afternoons at 1.30? Uh, Director Williams, go ahead. 
Thank you, Chair Flynn. Um, I'd like to point out that Dr. Cog does have a way to go program that mm -hmm. helps people find out how to get around. And perhaps everybody who is on this group could be provided with the best ways to get to a downtown meeting without each of us driving our own cars. And then we would demonstrate that we are invested in our own greenhouse gas planning. And if that were to happen, um, I guess I would come downtown on the number six bus. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Silverstein, go ahead. Yes, hi, thank you. And um, I think this meeting time uh, that we've had traditionally has worked out very well. It's it's an early start, which is good. That uh, gets us out in front of our day. And uh, I really do support, you know, reconvening in person like we have in the past. I've missed those interactions with uh, with folks and we're beginning to um, convene the Regional Air Quality Council Board in person as well. And, and had one meeting and it's, uh, you know, a challenge getting back to uh, the way we used to do things. Having a hybrid option is important, I think. Um, we we do encourage our board members to uh, come in person, but we understand that, uh, you know, folks, especially living further out, um, find it more challenging to get downtown. But I, I do uh, support that, uh, that way to go option that was just mentioned. Hey, there are lots of transit and, uh, and other appropriate ways to get downtown and attend our meetings. So again, I, I support this time that we've traditionally had and the in-person um, uh, you know, format. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next up, Director White. Go ahead. Well, thanks, Chair. Um, I I concur. I'd I'd love to see you all in person, uh, and you know, maybe there with the technology, the ability to go to virtual in in bad weather or for other reasons. Um, in terms of the the time, I would love we'd start a bit earlier, uh, eight a.m. so that. Um, I can get to my other meetings that seem, seem to fill up on Tuesdays a bit earlier as well. But other than that, I'm, I'm, this has been on my calendar for a few years now and happy to uh, keep coming and, and to join you all in person. Thank you. Um, uh, Ron, go ahead. And Doug, can you make some notes on some of these comments like uh, Rebecca's about, uh, thank you, about the start time? Go ahead, Ron. Thank you, Chair Flynn. Just because it's come up a couple of times, that I, I did want to speak to the technology piece. Um, I will say that we have been working hard since we have decided to reconvene the Transportation Advisory Committee meetings in person, starting with the April 25th meeting. Um, one of the things that we have appreciated during the pandemic and virtual meetings is the accessibility of our meetings to the public. And, you know, particularly those uh, folks that might want to comment on an agenda topic or make public comment, but not, not require them to commit to, you know, several hours of uh, travel time and then uh, just to comment for three minutes and then leave again. And so we have been uh, working really hard to come up with a technology solution so that the meeting can occur in person for members and alternates, but that we will stream, continue to stream effectively the Zoom meeting so that the public or other interested parties can uh, view the meeting um, online and not have to not have to travel and we can still accommodate public comment, but the members and alternates uh, would participate in person so uh, we think we have a pretty good handle on the technology side of that. Um, and uh, our first test of that will be uh, at the TAC meeting uh, next Monday, uh, but we're pretty confident we've got that worked out and look forward to utilizing that for the for the next RTC meeting. Thank you. I might tune into that then and see how it works. We sort of gave that a test run with the Metro Area County Commissioners on uh, Friday, uh, Doug, if you recall. And I thought it worked out really well. Our presenters were remote, uh, but county commissioners, most of them were uh, were in the room. And uh, there was a lot of Q&A and back and forth. It actually worked out better than, than I had expected, uh, having dealt with some glitches through this last two years. Uh, Director Cook, you're up. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I think this is what Ron was saying, but to the extent you are Zooming, um, if it would be an option for some of the folks who are far flung or for one reason or another, weather or whatever, couldn't make it, could also then still participate. Um, that would be great. 
Um, and and for start times, I guess I'd prefer the the staying at the 8.30 start time. Um, I would be taking transit. It would work out well <laughs> just from a selfish standpoint. So thank you. Thank you. Any others? Any other comments? Oh, since uh, uh, Director Cook chimed in, I will, I will say that from staff's perspective, we've struggled with um, sort of the, the distance. Where do, you, where do you draw the line in terms of how far is too far to have to allow sort of members to participate remotely versus in person? So uh, given that we have struggled to uh, figure out what that line is, our, our suggestion has been that uh, members and alternates uh, uh, participate in the meeting in person and other interested parties in the public can can view the meeting online. Um, I think, you know, to Rebecca's point, if there were uh, inclement weather or some other reason and we felt like we didn't want to or couldn't cancel the meeting, certainly we could uh, invest, we could uh, pursue changing tack to a virtual meeting. But I, I think having the mixture of members participating remotely and in person might be a little bit more challenging and from our perspective might diminish the uh, the reason for having in-person meetings where folks are actually in the room together and facilitating a better in-person dialogue it probably like many of you um, we've we've participated in hybrid meetings and our our general experience has been that uh, hybrid meetings for the members and alternates that are participating in the meeting uh, is, is sort of a diminished experience for both those people in person and those people online thank you ron uh, Director Williams. Thank you, Chair, um, for a second bite of the apple, as we say, and I, I'm inclined to agree with Ron. It, it's not something that anybody has really worked out well. I went to a downtown Denver partnership meeting where I was virtual and everybody else was there, and, and I was like, hello, I'm, I'm here. You know, I need to know what's going on in the room. Um, so it, it needs some background, but my question was, are we, um, do I need to go like put my bus schedule on my calendar for May? Are we talking about like the May meeting? I see Director Rex shaking his head. Yes. Okay. Yes, I just thought everybody might want to know that this is not a theoretical discussion. This is something <laughs> that we are planning for immediately. Okay. Right. I'm in. I'll see you downtown. Thank you. Uh, our our uh, Dr. Todd board is back in in person in May as well. So May is, uh, uh, we, we hope there's no snow, so there's no inclement weather excuse. I might add, Ron, that the experience would also be diminished if I, uh, the, the experience of an in-person meeting would also be diminished if it took me an hour and a half to get from Southwest Denver to downtown in a 12 inch snowstorm. So uh, that, that's something we do need to consider. Yes, sir. Uh, any other comments? I don't see any hands raised. So thank you for that discussion. Uh, we'll we'll bring this back, Doug. Right at the uh, exact committee tomorrow, we can talk about this. Yes, sir. But I I would anticipate, based on the comments I've heard today, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Chairman. It sounds like uh, we're we're planning on meeting in person at our, yes. our the May meeting at eight thirty. Yes. We're looking so forward far. to seeing everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And that brings us to the next item, which is next meeting, May seventeenth, twenty twenty two, in the Dr. Cog. Uh, Villa downtown, the spacious ac uh, accommodations of Dr. Cog at 1001 17th Street. And we'll see you then. Uh, with uh, no other business here, I believe we can be adjourned then. You have, uh, uh, right, we did exactly one hour. Thank you very, uh, very much, everybody. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.